Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorraine Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Today we're going to address one of the most important issues facing our state right now, and that is the behavioral health crisis. To speak about it today, I'm honored to have two senators, Senator Mary Kay Papin, who's the president pro tem of the New Mexico Senate, and Senator Jerry Otizipino, who is the chair of the Public Affairs Committee. You both have worked at this so long. I just want to say we're taping before the end of the current 30-day session because news has broken lately with an attorney general decision about the behavioral health scandal, and we're going to address that today. I'll give you time to talk about some of your important bills this session with the understanding that we don't know the ending of the story, how it's going to turn out. Um, First, I would like to, would you talk a little about your background and, and why you're so oh. well qualified to address this issue? Well, thanks, Lorene. And I suppose it's because uh, I, I'm a retired social worker. I spent 40 years uh, working in New Mexico as a social worker in both the public and private sectors. And a lot of my work during those years was in the area of behavioral health, both as a, a direct caregiver uh, and also as a, you know, a policy formulator at the agency level or at the city level, uh, trying to figure out a way that we could do a better job of getting behavioral health services out there to the people who need them. Uh, behavioral health, incidentally, is a term we've just recently started using. We used to say drug, alcohol uh, treatment, and mental health services. But now we use the umbrella term behavioral health to cover all of these various services. And uh, Senator Papin, some of your background, you have gotten all these awards from the New Mexico Mental Health Alliance. You've gotten the Outstanding Legislator, the Domenici Family Award, but also nationally, the American Psycholo Psychologist Practice Association named you, you know, nationally a Legislator of the Year. So you've been fighting, both of you, these battles for a long time. Tell me a little about what what why this is so important to you. Well, it's important to me because my grandson is schizophrenic and bipolar. And so this is something that I didn't seek out to try and do something about. It's something that have, it was laid in the lap of my family. And so we've walked these shoes for 22 years now trying to make sure that people who suffered from behavioral health problems uh, were able to get the kind of access and the kind of services that they needed. And uh, so that, that has been uh, both my daughter, Susan Vescovo, who's the mother of my grandson, and myself, we've worked very, very hard in this field to try and make things better. Well, um, just this last week, the Attorney General <coughs> announced that he had cleared 10 more of the behavioral health providers of all charges, you know, that there was not credible cause to suspect them of fraud. And so this has thrown this back into the full light, not only of the state, but nationally. We've right. been in the spotlight because it, if this is pay to play yeah. or whatever, then it does show our usual, you know, fifth in the country for corruption and cronyism. And, um, you know, it just, f for many, many reasons, this is represents a, a wrong that needs to be righted. Would you be so kind, Senator Ortiz Pino, to <clears throat> give to people who maybe this happened two and a half years ago, who are not up to speed, if you can give us a short version of what what happened to our behavioral health providers. I'll, I'll be glad to try, uh, Loreen. I think it really began when uh, the, the State Human Services Department, which is the Medicaid agency in the state, and also is the behavioral health agency in the state. It, it's the authority for behavioral health, Medicaid and non-Medicaid alike. When it decided um, about four years ago that it was going to stop doing what we had done before, which was called Salud. That was the name of our Medicaid program. And it was going to change that to Centennial Care. Under Salud, there was one agency that handled all behavioral health. It's a private for-profit company called Optum Health. Under Centennial Care, they've gone to contracts with four separate 
managed care organizations, each of which has to do primary care, long-term care, and behavioral health. That switch is much more complicated than it sounds. Under behavioral health, we could track the dollars. I mean, under Salud, we could track the behavioral health dollars so that we knew that Optum was where you went if there was a problem. It was the Optum contract that was being looked at. It was the Optum contractors that were supposed to be serving the clients, and they served everybody in Medicaid. Under Centennial, it was going to be very different. There wouldn't be one place we could go for information. It was going, or for management, or for control, or for oversight. All four contractors were going to have contracts with a number, hundreds, of behavioral health providers, most of them private doctors, but also 15 big agencies that had pretty much been providing the bulk of the services under Salud. That shift, I think, was looking a little scary to some of these new uh, managed care companies that would be in the program now as Medicaid contract managers. That led them to want a careful examination of our system before the switch was made. So the state asked Optum, how are things going? Well, Optum had been, man uh, had been um, auditing these providers every year, and they had always had a clean bill of health. And so they reported back again, clean bill of health. But the state, I think being pressured by the managed care organizations that were going to take over the Centennial contract, started getting concerned. And they went to Arizona. And even before there was an audit, the final audit that apparently produced these fraud charges, they had gone to Arizona and contacted five companies in Arizona and asked them, if we change, would you be able to come in and take over our behavioral health system? These companies had me a Medicaid managed care experience in Arizona. And so they were the ones that the new MCOs that were going to have the centennial contract wanted. When they said yes, then the audit was done that produced, not surprisingly, findings that our 15 biggest providers were all guilty of fraud. And... $36 million with the fraud. And the accusation was right. from their, their sampling, well, this is $36 million that you owe us back. We're not going to pay you another dime of Medicaid money until these fraud charges have been prosecuted. That essentially wiped out our behavioral health system in the state. And in the, instead, they brought in five companies from Arizona. Those companies are now uh, be, had been paid $27 million additional dollars to take over, right. and now they're leaving. They can't make the profit they were promised in New Mexico under Centennial Care. What it's meant is we've lost the behavioral health system, the replacement agencies are gone, and many communities now have struggling to find some way to provide alcohol, drug, and behavioral health services to their needy families. Thank you for that summary. Right. It's very complicated. <coughs> mm -hmm. So it is complicated. This, the, the population that is served is our most vulnerable population. Right. Doesn't New Mexico, again, one of the lists, the bad lists that we don't like being on top of, very, uh, very high in the nation in terms of suicides, mental health, yes. drug and alcoholism. Overdose deaths. Overdose. Overdose. Suicide. You, you name yeah. it. It's, uh, That's right. And, you know, the other thing is, I think, uh, to sort of go couple on to what Jerry was saying, they were they were denied due process. All of these companies were denied due process. And so the, then the money was they would then they would come back and say, Well you owed uh six hundred dollars in bad uh billing. You put it in the wrong number or you or you forgot to have somebody sign or or whatever the reason was. Then they extrapolated that out to thousands or hundreds or millions of millions. dollars once they extrapolated it out and said, you know, you do that. But a lot of these companies as well uh, were told to continue giving services even when they were not paying them. You have to continue to give services. So many of these small companies, and they were good. I can speak of the one particularly out of Al uh, Alamogordo. Uh, they they were bankrupt, and he was absolutely wonderful trying to get back in and working with with Gerald Champion Hospital now, but and I believe some of them are being sued 
uh, Nicole Emanuel has come from Carolina and they have successfully uh, done a lawsuit in New Mexico uh, in support <coughs> of, of the uh, consulting services out of Alamogordo. And I anticipate that you may see a class action lawsuit coming from all of these providers uh, who are being freed. But I also think that we, uh, whether it's the Attorney General or whomever it is, should be looking at going back and there should be some responsibility charged back at what was done. We'll return to what we can do about it, but I want to pick up on what you said about due process, because even last session you had put in a bill. She, she, she tried for two years to yes, get a bill yes. done it's that a, would establish a way of doing that. It's a simple American premise in justice that you're able to face your accusers and answer to them. And one national magazine said, New Mexico nonprofits punished out of existence in Kafkaesque verge. You're accused of something, one of the providers said, in just one hour looking at our books, we could look at our errors. This could have been handled. But to be shut down, to be put out of business, those patients left bereft without yeah, care. Yeah. So Absolutely. Uh, so I, th I think that's right. And I think we need to get, there needs to be more to the bottom of this barrel that I we remember, need to look at. I remember when, when we were discussing either her legislation or at other times in committee hearings, legislators asking the state uh, human services department people, well, this doesn't seem right. Don't they have a chance to even present it? Don't they have a chance, first of all, to find out what they're accused of? Because they were never given the findings. That's right. And so they could prove themselves innocent. And, and they were said, oh, our hands are tied. Well, then we found out that wasn't true. The Medicaid regulations do not require them to not have a due process. And other states have one. But every time that Senator Papin or others, uh, other senators, Senator uh, O'Neill, uh, attempted right. a, a similar bill to just spell out some steps that the state would have to go through before it could just summarily end a Medicaid contract for accusations of fraud, the state, uh, the governor's office basically said, oh, no, we can't do that. We don't want due process. We want to be able to issue these, these draconian edicts that just right. ended what was going on. And another bill that you had was, let's define Medicaid fraud. Yes. If right. you're going to hang these people by the neck, let's define what Medicaid fraud is. And, and so thank you for your battles in this. I just want to mention we're speaking today with Senator Mary Kay Papin, the president pro tem of the New Mexico Senate, and Senator Jerry Ortiz Pino, the chair of public affairs, where a lot of these bills go through. We're discussing the crucial behavioral health crisis that has beset our state. And you started to go, what can be done about it? Um, some of the senators, Howie Morales, for example, called for an investigation. Mm -hmm. Our Congresswoman, Michelle Lujan Grisham, has been very angry about this. She wants to have the feds, since this was federal money, right. investigate what happened and how. What else, how can we get to the bottom of this? I, I think it, that... Frankly, I, I think nothing will happen until the administration changes because they've become so defensive about this that they simply would prefer to put their head in the sand. What we probably need to do is to take another look at the idea of, of carving out behavioral health into an area where we can actually right. see what's going on. What's happening is we're told we're spending more than ever before on the behavioral health part of Medicaid, but we don't see anything coming out of the other end of the pipeline. There's leaks in the pipeline, I think. It's being siphoned off to other purposes by the Medicaid managed care companies. Because frankly, we, we held hearings around the state last summer, and every community we went to, Las Cruces, Ruidoso, Silver City, and Roswell, every place we went, in the southern tier of the state for sure, they said we have much less in the way of resources than we did before this all started. So we're spending more and we're getting, getting less. less and I don't think we can find it until we pull the, the, that's my own view, let's pull that behavioral health money out again so we can look at it. Then we have a chance of combining it creatively with what some of the right. cities and counties are doing. They're beginning to tax themselves to create locally operated programs because the state services just aren't adequate to the task. You know, in legislative finance, uh, when the previous secretary was here, and I kept, every time they would bring up the centennial care, I kept saying, why don't you carve out 
behavioral health. You're carving out disabilities. They were out of the system and on their own. Why don't you carve it out? You just don't understand. This is going to work. And mm -hmm. I, I kept fighting that and fighting it yeah. I, I mean, like a brick wall. They never were interested in all in carving out the behavioral health and doing that so that it can be dealt with. You know, our prisons are our biggest mental health facilities in this state. I, I'm afraid that the current fiscal crisis that the state's facing, where we ha we're going to have to start trimming. And one of the areas they're going to start trimming is the Medicaid budget. There is literally, under this setup, setup that we have, no way of protecting the Medicaid component. It's just all filtered in through all of the other mm -hmm. Medicaid contracts. So if they have to cut, they'll cut the thing where the screams will be the less, the least uh, anguished, and that'll be behavioral health, because these are literally a clientele that does not have the ear of the public. I mean, they're wandering the streets, or they're getting drunk at home and in and, and, and lonely, you know, uh, uh, despair, and, and we just don't have a way of identifying them under this setup. Well, that's the, the cruelest thing about this, because it is these are the most vulnerable people. They don't have the ear of the public. They don't have a voice with which to speak. No. And um, uh, the families, too, so many families. So this has affected the agencies that provided the behavioral health care, the therapists and the, and the workers there, the patients themselves. I think in Valencia County, where this first came down, right. they had 3,000 behavioral health patients. It went down to 1,000. Those 2,000 people did not miraculously get well. They still needed the services. And the families that try to... Right to, you know, the families need support and help too. This was just uh, across the board. And so um, one of the things that Michelle Lujan Grisham thought was that the state needs to investigate exactly how we got here and there needs to be more federal oversight. But what concerns me is the glacial pace. It's taken two and a half years, just this week, Attorney General Balderas finally uh, dispensed um, remove the cloud of culpability from these 10 agencies. Right. Uh, you have been watching, we watched the pay-to-play stuff with Richardson, that took years. Mm -hmm. You have been watching the, the Housing Authority scandal for years, and, and we don't need to sweep it away into the corners. We need a bright, shining light on this, which is why I wanted to do this and show. And I think Balderas, when he was uh, the auditor, I think he also said he found nothing uh, when he was doing the audits. He found nothing in the audits. And then the legislature, we gave him uh, a lot, millions more to be able to finish up this whole thing. As I understand, mm -hmm. the other two, uh, he's just finishing the paperwork on the remaining two. And, and at last, we'll have the information. Unfortunately, it'll have, so far, the, the agencies have all been declared innocent of the charges, but they're out of business. Yeah. You know, a, a, a few of them managed to survive because, well, for example, Presbyterian Medical Services here in northern New Mexico, they just paid the $4 million. They had the resource to do that. They said that we, we don't want this to be an admission of guilt in any sense. But we need but to if continue we, working. We, if we're ever going but to continue, right. we, we can't wait two years. That's why some people Stay said this wasn't a shake-up. This was a shake-down. Yes. Yeah, I yeah. think, and so, I, I think and literally that. I that think is. if others had been had the resources to make those same kinds of payments, mm -hmm. they probably would not mm -hmm. have been put out of That's business. Right. YDI made their payment as well. Youth development mm -hmm. in Albuquerque, it was, but it was much smaller. It was, I think, 125000 And so they just said, look, we're not admitting guilt either, but here's 125000 Let us stay in the program. It literally is the only way agencies can survive if you're in behavioral health. If you're not in the Medicaid program, if you're not part of that billion dollars that we're spending on behavioral health through Medicaid, there is so little left, and there'll be even less left outside of Medicaid after this budget, that you cannot survive if you're not a Medicaid agency. I don't think a few local agencies that that get city money and you know uh, alcohol treatment money of various sorts, maybe they can survive. But basically, I Medicaid. They, I don't think they'll grow. No, no, they can't grow. They they'll, won't grow. They're just they're just stymied right there. It's, it's the Medicaid is not even the 500-pound gorilla any longer. Mm. It is the only gorilla in the cage. Uh, uh, well, I know New Mexicans really want some accountability here. And um, I, I'm asking how can we possibly repair the, the immense damage that was done? I know that some of the cleared agencies are now suing 
to get those frozen funds back. For some of them, it will come too late because they're already out of business. But what other ways, how can we make ourselves whole again and make these patients whole? Well, you know, I think it's going to take a while, and I think it's going to take a change of, of heart, maybe, within the executive branch uh, to, to look at this and say, you know, maybe this was not the best thing to do uh, to bring behavioral health and where it should be in this state. But I think until we get everybody on the same page, it's going to be difficult. But I do think that we need to investigate what went on why it went on, and to see what we can do to uh, try and at least make the system as whole as we can possibly make it. Right. And I think Jerry has worked very hard in that, and his committee uh, has had a lot of hearings uh, to be able to. And I do think that, that the two things we've already talked about would help immensely if, if Senator Papin's uh, accountability or due process <coughs> legislation were in place, we would be able to prevent these kind mm -hmm. of problems in the future. The other thing is I think if we could carve out behavioral health Medicaid right. from all the rest of it, that would give us at least a place to look. We honestly, <laughs> Lorraine, it's hard to believe this, but we don't know how much we're spending on any of this going on right now. I mean, we know the, the, the figures they tell us about how much is on behavioral health, but whether it's getting spent on behavioral health is impossible because and, it's and just... What, and what it's being spent on. And exactly. What it's exactly. Being, yeah. You know, because you take one person in an episode and they're in the hospital for a week or two weeks. That amount of money that it takes because they're not getting the services or not getting what they need is astronomical. And what we're paying to put people in prison. And what kind of what kind of a behavioral health system do we have in our prisons, or in our youth prisons, which also have a very high population of people who have behavioral health issues? I, I want to finish the history because this yes. is yes. a good yes. lead into the yes. history. Mm -hmm. Because I think what went on was that the the state and the HMOs that took these this new centennial era of contracts realized that those 15 agencies were so deeply rooted in their communities that they wouldn't sit by quietly while less money was being spent on behavioral health. They knew that they would be loud in their controversial crying out for help. They knew they had friends in the legislature, like Senator Papin, and they knew they could come to her and she would raise cane if they didn't keep their, the same amount of spending going on. The maintenance of effort was what they did not want to go on. Mm -hmm. They wanted to spend less right. on behavioral health because they knew they, they couldn't make money on it. This is not an area where you can make money if you do it right. You can only make money on behavioral health if you refuse services. <clears throat> and that's not what we wanted. That's and right. so that's why I really think it's so crucial. And I think that was the, ultimately the motivation behind this whole debacle, that they would like to have been able to say, We've, we're, we're spending a lot more on behavioral health, and nobody would be there to contest that. Hmm. Well, now we're facing this budget crisis, and people say, can we afford, can we afford to fix this? Hmm. But the real question is, can we afford not to fix it? These are our I most agree. vulnerable citizens. I agree. I mean, because I think it gets more complicated, and the money gets more money that's going to have to be spent as we do this, and we don't provide the services. I mean, you look at, I, I know this is, but you look at the Boyd case. If he uh, had been in behavioral health services and been getting the services and doing that, would, would that situation have been there? And how much money will be paid out? Uh, we had a case in Las Cruces, the Slevin case. We paid out over $15 million. We, we will be so paying we'll be one paying. way or another for this, for this in the future because our jails will be crowded with people that are, you know, we say we spend $45,000 a year to keep somebody in prison or jail in this state. But the reality is if somebody is mentally ill, we spend a heck of a lot more than that in, while they're in prison because mm -hmm. we've got to provide some way of them managing their behavior. Otherwise, they're incredibly disruptive and they melt right. down and have all kinds right. of problems. So those are the most expensive of our inmates. Right. This is going to be very expensive if we don't step back and say, look, instead of trying to do this on the cheap by letting the Medicaid agencies make money off of 
saying no to people. Let's make them really part of an overall system that cares for people and that cures some of these problems before they reach the point where we have to put them in prison. That's right. Well, we're not going to have time to get to your bills from the last session. Maybe you can come <laughs> back and do that. Um, would you speak to our audience? You know, some the, the most important thing they know about, they need to know about what has happened with behavioral health, where we stand now. Well, I, th I think when we try and move forward with trying to get to the bottom of this and what is happening, uh, that we need the we need the public support on this. Jerry needs it in his committee. He runs an interim committee for us on health. And we need to we need to have the support of the public in this and the families. There's hundreds of families out there that have people with behavioral health problems, and we need them to be speaking up and to be helping and and to demand that they are able to get the kind of services for their family members that, that, that that's needed. Thank you. To me, the most uh, encouraging thing is that uh, cities like Las Cruces and Albuquerque and Santa Fe have all begun stepping up and saying, this, right. is a, this is our responsibility too. And now what we need is a way to get the public's interest in this right. and the family's interest, the local community's local government interest, and the state's money to work together in an in a, in a, in a overall comprehensive solution. It can be done. Many right. states have done it. We were very close to having it done previously. Now let's go back and, 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 and not dwell it. on the past so much. Just try to yeah. fix it. That's and right. at Las Cruces, you know, they're doing a thing, La Clinica's coming in. They've not been in the mental health facil uh, business at all. They've been in providing services for families and pregnancy and primary all the care. primary care. And so they're stepping up, but they're trying uh, desperately to find psychiatrists to come in. That's something else in being able to find the qualified people to come in and provide these services. But they're partnering with Memorial Medical Center. They're partnering with Mesilla Valley Mental Health Hospital and trying to come together as a collaborative and pull together the mental health services in Las Cruces and Doniana County. Well, I hope that as a result of this show that our public will become more engaged and more collaborative in this important effort that affects our state so much. Yes, I'd like to thank you. you both for your hard work and for thank being you. with us on Report from Santa Fe. Our guests are Senator Jerry Ortiz Pino, Democrat from Bernalillo County, head, I forgot to mention, of the Interim Legislative Health and Human Services Committee. Right. Thank right. you for joining us. And we're both running for re-election, we should say that. <laughs> <laughs> and Senator Mary Kay Papin, Democrat from Doniana County, President Pro Tem of the Senate, thank you for all of the work that you've done on this. Thank you for having us. Yes. And thank I'm you. Lorraine And Mills. helping us get the message out. It's yes, a very important a, message. It's a very important message. Thank you. You're I'm right. Lorreen Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.